Um, welcome to UCLA. Welcome to our lecture series. Um, uh, before I get started, uh, let me remind you that on Monday, April 22nd, we have Iñaki Abelos and Renata Sankiewicz. Uh, so you should plan to, uh, to join us for those. Um, really pleased to have my friend David here uh, this evening. Um, by way of introduction, I thought I'd start wide and go narrow. Uh, <clears throat> I've been very lucky so far uh, in my career to run with some of the wilder ones of my generation. I think we probably see a few of them here uh, today, pausing for a moment to rest and take signals from one of the big dogs on the tundra, David Rue. Um, this group really does seem canine to me. It runs in a pack. Uh, organized as, as a relatively lateralized body in which each dog plays its own role. There's a hierarchy of sorts, but it's more horizontal than vertical, which is visible mostly internally. There's aggression, but mostly it's aimed outward. Internal relations are nearly always affectionate. Um, it's a roving thing. Unlike most sound, still right? Uh, it's a roving thing. Moving constantly, hunting, and this movement is as instinctive as, as it is rational because from the start there's been a trust in the more subliminal impulses that are as much a part of our discipline as the ones that require conscientious instruction. Uh, yet for all of this pack like behavior, each dog is its own object, as David would say. And one of them, David, has always maintained a certain distance that would probably frighten the rest of us. He's often been the one that ranges for this time. To me, it feels like he is reaching with a subsequent pole exerted on the rest of us that gets us into new territory. I'm very grateful to him. Um, <clears throat> last year, he went out again in what is likely his most assertive and influential reach to date with his article, Returning to Strange Objects. He presented these ideas at CIDARC a few months ago, and in his introduction, Hernan said, in reference to the title, David, you never left the strange object. You are the strange object. A wonderful way to say something similar uh, to what I've just tried to say. Uh, which got me to wondering, what makes David so strange in the first place? What gives him the distance to see things differently? David received his undergraduate degree at St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The program there is what's called a classics education, where you read the classics all four years uh, as the backbone for your education. <clears throat> I think this must account for some of the distance uh, since it would provide a whole cosmos of references from outside of architecture. He went on to receive his Master of Architecture from Columbia and was among the very first graduates of the now famous Paperless Studio. There too we find distance, in that case a distance born from within the discipline at a time when ties to our most fundamental assumptions and methods were suddenly stretched to a breaking point. Since that time, David has taught at some of the more interesting schools of architecture including the University of Pennsylvania and Pratt Institute, and is currently visiting Professor Sire. <coughs> Early in his professional career, he worked with Reiser and Momoto on a variety of their uh, most important projects, and most significantly, perhaps, is his credit as co-designer of the Water Garden for Jeff Kittens, a now seminal project that, for me, is like the Smith songs, How Soon Is Now. In 1984, that one song changed everything in rock music and remains untouchable. And the water garden did the same thing for us in 1997. <clears throat> More recently, he works in collaboration with his partner, Carol Klein, in their office, uh, Ruth Klein, on a variety of project types, some to be built, some not, some written. Their entry to the PS1 competition continued that tradition of the best entries often losing, and collects their piece in the Matters of Sensation exhibition um, helped make that show as important. I mentioned the Sci Art lecture he gave a few months ago. I'm hoping tonight we hear an extension of that. Whatever he does, I think you'll find it distanced to some degree from lectures we've become used to from designers. We've come to expect a long series of images, nearly every one of the designer's own work, with a talk that stays very close to whatever the immediate preoccupations of each image might be. Usually David doesn't do this, uh, instead opting to distance himself from his own work in a strange way, and show us images of other things and other work. References to his own project often seem side-long, 
lenses from across the field that are broad and varied. That is the distance he seems to like to keep. Speaking of fields, David fired a warning shot across the battle field theory with the text I mentioned in the election sire. I wonder if tonight he'll fire a second, this one to put a hole in the ball. We'll see, I guess. Even if he doesn't, we can already see the other dogs rallying around that first shot, hungry to drag down something for the day for dinner. <clears throat> I'm certain David will refer often to objects tonight, and that word is, of course, related to objectivity. Maybe that's why David likes objects so much, because he is so objective, able to maintain his distance from things in order to measure them all more carefully. He is, as Hernan said, a strange object and, uh, among us, and he is, as well, strangely objective about the things we do in our discipline. So, yes. Indulge me one more minute. This is a surprise for David. Um, <laughs> David did this. <clears throat> this will just take one minute. Uh, strange. Take this for example. Uh, who finds captive globe? What New Yorker tries to process the depressing aftermath of 9 11 by creating a rendering depicting a lighthearted yet paranoid alternative cause uh, for the destruction of the Twin Towers, adding to the conspiracy theories already swirling around this event? Perverse as this is, it's nevertheless an act of objective distance, backing up from something to see it better. Because look at what he's done. Um, probably appropriate I show this is because I just am endlessly fascinated with this rendering that they did. And I don't think you ever showed this probably. Um, so <laughs> you, have see, you, you have to see this project and know it. Um, so look what he's done. Close and now I did a close reading of this project. <laughs> close analysis shows uh, that he's reworked OMA's City of the Captain Globe, Globe in the process. Um, I'm guessing here, but I think he's triangulated us through Cool Houses Manhattan, a field where objects hide in plain sight, uh, through the absurd events of 9-11, and back around again to a place where that field is blown away to reveal the objects that it's part all along. The audacity of these moves is obvious and would be ridiculous were it not for its rigor, whose rendering being as carefully constructed as OMA's. The picture planes are the same proportions, for example, as is the angle of view, and I'm nearly certain the, pers the perspective of their rendering has been tweaked to where the axonometric. I'm getting, I'm, I read it right. I promise you, David. The shading of the buildings match those of the top image, while that of the helicopter uh, which is different, you see, match those at the bottom image, which is an alternative version of the, of the one they rendering. Further still, I'm betting the number of subdivisions on that sphere is exactly to something in Colossus' image, probably the number of cells in the grid, which equals 30 in the upper right. And by my count, there are 2,000 raised bumps on David's sphere, which is the number of blocks in the Manhattan City grid. <laughs> if I'm right, David is an involuted OMA's piece, essentially wrapping both it and the Manhattan grid around his strange model at ground zero, displacing yet not erasing the field in favor of the object. All of this is to say that like Kubrick, Drew, Drew brings us closer to things through the art of strange with which, at its heart, has to do with the objective certainty that can only come from distance. You know, the most important part, though, which is what the chapter that the globe turns out to be Jason. <laughs> David Roof. I want to get a help. semester spring because uh, to be able to lecture at SIRE and at UCLA in the same semester is a real treat 
not to mention being introduced by Hernan over there and Jason over there. It's really too good to be true. Uh, I'm not going to repeat uh, the lecture I gave at SciArc. Uh, for one, they have it posted online, and two, uh, a bunch of you were there too. Uh, so what I'm planning on doing tonight is to speak about uh, what led to that paper uh, and talk a little bit about what was in there too. Uh, to make it uh, interesting for those of you that weren't at that lecture also. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, give a brief introduction um, and make six points, um, uh, six ideas, and I'm going to fold in some of our work. So this is a bit more of a personal <coughs> lecture uh, the one that Sire was more about delivering the paper. So this one I'd like to speak a little bit more informally. So uh, I titled the introduction Gold Rush because uh, back uh, when Jason and I were at school at Columbia University and graduating from the MR program there in the mid-90s, uh, it was indeed a pretty peculiar time. Uh, we weren't uh, really the, f uh, the first generation of the digital immigrants. We we're more like a, uh, the immigrants themselves because uh, both Jason and I, we were taught in a very traditional way. So, And we were quite into it too. Uh, I was into drawing. Strange uh, projective geometries with Andy Zago and rotating objects on an opaque bond sheet, all, all kinds of disciplinary fun that uh, we came to fetishize quite a bit, like building models and so on. So, when all of a sudden the paperless studio was announced uh, at Columbia, uh, I, I know Jason, like myself, probably. Uh, thought it smelled a little bit of a fad or perhaps uh, kind of a gold rush where a lot of mistakes would be made. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I think we embraced it. Perhaps uh, we had to embrace it. But that's something that I think uh, he and I have shared very much in common, which was indeed a degree of distance or skepticism this plain skepticism about what was initially happening with the computer. So uh, this is where it happened uh, in this uh, interesting McKean Mead and White building, home of Ken Frampton, home of Avery Library. So it was, it was kind of an incongruous uh, lo locus for this digital revolution. And uh, there are all kinds of uh, kind of uh, drunkenness uh, images like this that seem to signal some uh, future that we've all been waiting for, uh, but perhaps not desired. And uh, of course, uh, you know, when we see pictures like this from a computer garbage dump, I mean, this is uh, the kind of reality that we knew was inevitable. Nonetheless, we saw all kinds of uh, proclamations about how a turn, corner had been turned and how nothing will ever be the same again. This was the infamous architecture issue that had uh, uh, the photograph of the Columbia faculty, uh, three quarters of which uh, weren't even involved with the paperless studio, which was funny. Things like that seem to happen all the time in Columbia. And uh, the reality for those of us that were really the first to really start getting our hands dirty, learning how to use this stuff, uh, yeah. I still get a shudder of fear in it. When I, I put the slide in it, but it still scares me when I see it. <laughs> but the, this was almost a daily occurrence. Uh, this is the kind of madness we have to deal with. And uh, there, I, I myself didn't personally witness this. Uh, 
but uh, our good friend Ferda Kolotan informs me that in the first paperless studio, strangely enough, they hadn't even hooked up a printer to the computer, so there was just no way to get output. So some students were building these weird cardboard visors so they could film or photograph the screen, or the kind of cunning or the cleverness of uh, Jason Payne who would take trace paper to the screen to, and trace what was on the screen to output a drawing. And that's what it was really like. I mean, that was the, the condition of the gold rush, and this initial rush to understand the computer. And this was the first uh, project I did on the computer. And uh, I think uh, very, uh, I'm, I'm not immune you know, to these things. And uh, I totally succumbed to the diagram. And so what you see here is uh, initial kind of experimentation with drawing nerves and trying to correlate to a kind of a Dewey Decimal System organization to conflate knowledge with nerve geometry and then generate some form, you know. And so this was the kind of initial premise that I think uh, was quite serious at the time, that the computer was indeed a computing device. And on an intuitive level, there was the expectation that uh, we were after solutions of some sort, that it, it was a kind of instrument for engaging in abstractions on a level that we never could in manual drawing, but the premise was that's what we always wanted to do in manual drawing. However, I think uh, over the years I've come to think that there was something else going on in drawing, yeah, something that was not so much about solutions. So uh, this was the kind of form that I started uh, pulling out of the diagram and and I remember presenting this, and, uh, and Greg Lynn was on the jury for this. Uh, and I remember he was smiling, and Jesse Reiser looked very perplexed. And uh, in retrospect, uh, despite my best efforts to explain it through the diagram, the only thing that seemed to endure from it was the kind of intuitive interest in the object itself, and the figuration, <coughs> aesthetics, whatever. Uh, compulsion I had as a designer relative to uh, this new instrument that I couldn't quite put my fingers on at that time. I think that's what ended up enduring. Uh, so I end this introduction with the last image I had made before graduating. And this was uh, heavily trashed by everybody when I did it because it was a collage. And uh, I didn't quite understand at the time because my knowledge of uh, the past 30 years were pretty limited still at that point. I couldn't understand what was so bad about collage in the first place. Uh, but what I think became kind of interesting in retrospect, and this is something that uh, preoccupies me quite a bit right now, uh, was even though uh, it might have been using collage technique, uh, the interest was not in the effects of the collage itself, but to produce a, a unity, a strange unity or a coherence uh, to the making of a strange object. So the first point that I want to make uh, is this term synthetic sublime. And uh, this is actually a term that uh, Jason Payne invented for me because I was using the word artificial or uh, not quite real or against nature. And Jason said, well, why don't you just use the word synthetic? And it kind of stuck. And it's become kind of an important word for me. Uh, so what interests me about uh, the term sublime was uh, in the first few years as I started thinking about my own work and started taking the problems of aesthetics more seriously, and not so much instrumentality or geometry. Uh, I gravitated very naturally, I think, to the traditions of the sublime. It's something that I already had a little bit of knowledge of from my studies and the classics, as Jason mentioned. And what interested me quite a bit was the aura of the sublime uh, was a function of distance. 
And uh, it was a very peculiar relationship uh, that we operated in, in relationship to nature. So this is your kind of, uh, kind of uh, typical kind of uh, image of what we would like to think nature is. However, if you zoom in just on a little spot there, you might uh, discover uh, some, something irrational embedded in there. Mm -hmm. And this is a great scene in the original Frankenstein movie, I think, very deliberately setting the monster within the sublime territory. And as you know, this story does not have a happy ending. The little girl is throwing flowers into the lake, and then the monster wants to see if she'll float to it, tosses her in, and then all hell breaks loose after that. Uh, but the monster is, is essentially technology, and as many people have commented, Mary Shelley's story is very much, uh, is deeply embedded in the history of the Industrial Revolution, and uh, the first uh, paranoias about whether or not technology is going to save us, it's actually going to destroy us. So in our time, we have a different kind of Frankenstein story. And this is a, a movie that was pretty popular in its time, and it was called Gattaca. And it was a future where human beings are being genetically modified. And it's kind of hilarious that it's uh, uh, these two. Uh, Uma on the right is genetically modified and she's perfect in every way, super healthy, super intelligent. And poor Ethan Hawke on the left uh, was born naturally without modification and there's all kinds of things wrong with him. And what's, what interested me about this narrative was that in our time the natural born subject even there is the monster. Uh, everybody else has become uh, synthetic. So I'm very interested in uh, how technology has opened doors to frontiers, all of which have aesthetic uh, implications. And something as dumb as the solar panel is an instrument by which uh, this frontier was reached. Just like sails and old wooden ships, it was it enabled us to get into a territory that we have not seen. So I'm very interested in scenes like this because it's difficult to evaluate how our categories of judgment really uh, help us understand the values in images like this that we now see all the time. However, when such technologies come back down to us in architecture, You see this uh, kind of poignant uh, condition where architecture is caught in between. It's caught in between these, these instruments and their implications, but also culture and history, economy, so on. And architecture is just in this very kind of poor position where it's trying to resolve things that might be irreconcilable. So here is a uh, your classic European enlightenment mind overlooking the unknowable out there, which in the 20th century flips and no longer is the subject matter of the sublime, the unknowable that's out there, but it's the unknowable that is us. This was uh, what I was thinking while I was doing the initial work. Uh, this is the kind of uh, early stuff uh, we do when we're trying to make a name for ourselves. And very naturally, I started uh, thinking less about the techniques and more about uh, just how to render these things. Because in the end, I was interested more in the aesthetics of these technologies and what they imply. And don't get me wrong, there's a hell of a lot of technique uh, embedded in here too. It's more that uh, I started to think that it was better to sublimate the discourse about the technique 
and foreground the things that might uh, be understood as more uh, accessible in general. So sometime during the first five years, I started talking less and less about tessellation and such, and more about uh, conditions of luster or, or conditions of figure and how to render versus how to model. And this naturally started bringing me into an investigation of some very disciplinary topics as well regarding ornament, regarding articulation, and so on. But all of this was couched in this background thought about the synthetics of one. This is the second point. Around this time, I started reading uh, more hardcore papers and computation because I started wanting to know what was really going on inside this thing. Not the software, not uh, the interface that signified still the drawing of the line, but what's really going on here in the, in the switches? So is this pattern random? And obviously not. There's a, quite a clear pattern. How about this? Does this look a little bit more random? It does a little bit. But still, we suspect that there's probably a pattern here as well. How about this one? If you can figure out the pattern on this, you'll be a celebrity. Uh, this is merely the sequence of prime numbers. And this is an interesting debate that uh, is mentioned by the computer scientist Gregory Chapin in his discourse related to Leibniz. What he points out about the prime number sequence, something that is so everyday, something that we all know, but remains so mysterious, there have been theorems that uh, can more or less accurately predict the distribution of the primes. But still, there really is no theory of what generates primes. That is why there is still today in the world supercomputers that are factoring gigantic numbers. And then when the next prime number is proven, it's uh, kind of Christmas Day in the world of mathematics. And so what this uh, signifies uh, is something quite interesting. Uh, Maybe if I could try and dumb it down, uh, it basically means there is no theory of prime or there is no function that can produce it. There is no parametric equation for generating prime numbers. Why is that? When the identity of the prime numbers are so clear, there seems to be an obvious pattern to their distribution. But yet, there is no theory of how to generate. This is related to this question of randomness. So this is uh, the only thing I'm going to read uh, today. Uh, but this is by Gregory Chaitin, and it's uh, worth a closer look. Chaitin writes, uh, my story begins with Leibniz in 1683, the year before Newton published his Principia. Due to a snowstorm, Leibniz is forced to take a break in his attempts to improve the water pumps for some important German silver mines, and writes down an outline of some of his ideas, now known to us as the Discourse on Metaphysics. Leibniz then sends a summary of the major points through a mutual friend to the famous fugitive French philosopher Arnaud, who is so horrified at what he reads that Leibniz never sends him nor anyone else the entire manuscript. It languages among Leibniz's voluminous personal papers and is only discovered and published many years after his death. In sections five and six of the Discourse in Metaphysics, Leibniz discusses the crucial question of how we can distinguish a world which can be explained by science from one that cannot. How do we tell whether something we observe in the world around us is subject to some scientific law, or just patternless and random. 
Imagine, Leibniz says, that someone has splattered a piece of paper with ink spots, determining in this manner a finite set of points on the page. Leibniz observes that even though the points were splattered randomly, there will always be a mathematical curve that passes through this finite set of points. Indeed, many good ways to do this are now known. For example, what is called Lagrangian interpolation will be just fine. So the existence of a mathematical curve passing through a set of points cannot enable us to distinguish between points that are chosen at random and those that obey some kind of scientific law. Uh, if you think back on what I was just saying about the prime numbers. How then can we tell the difference? Well, says Leibniz, if the curve that contains the points must be extremely complex, then it's not much use in explaining the pattern itself. It doesn't really help to simplify the matters, and therefore isn't valid as a scientific law. That is, if the theory is more complex than the thing, that's no criteria for a theory. Why not just have the thing itself be the theory? The thing itself is its own theory, which is fascinating. The important insight here is that something is random if any description of it is more complex than the thing itself. Randomness is complexity. So this absolutely fascinated me, that random is not something you think of in gambling, indeterminacy about what happens next, but it's a condition of information, it's a condition of patterns. It's an organizational problem. That gave, charged me up to reconsider what fascinated me in the first place in nature. Just a simple, beautiful field of wildflowers and bloom is practically undrawable or untheorizable. In this sense, the thing itself is its own theory. There is no theory that can simplify it. This, uh, you may begin to think already, has some pertinence in our time. When we're looking for parameters to explain complex phenomena, or looking to reduce the complexity of the real through simpler abstractions, it may be the case that certain things are irreducibly complex and essentially random. So I always save this photo in particular on my hard drive. It just fascinated me how just how monstrous this is. And it speaks to an affinity we have since we're young to be comfortable in a world that is outrageously diverse where nothing is the same. We're quite comfortable with the fact that no two people are alike, no two anything is alike. However, architecture, or at least the structures or the abstractions through which we operate in architecture seems to be following a different kind of model. So how do you produce something as beautiful as a field of wildflowers? And I say that the word beauty very loosely here. I just hope you, you get what I mean by that. Uh, so when I saw this photograph, uh, it, it was an interesting inspiration because initially you would think you would have to go and plant every single wildflower, that you would have to put it and compose it in exactly the same spot. Now this photograph, which is a still from the filming of the movie Metropolis, you may, you may remember that scene in the swimming pool. The director here with the megaphone there is issuing a set of simple commands. He is not in the water positioning every single arm. There is a different approach to the problem of agency. This is what we started exploring then uh, in, and this was kind of a red herring where we uh, advertised that uh, we were just interested in uh, 
engaging in a series of experiments and visual fabrication. This was uh, 10 years ago, so back then, laser cutting lumen, lumen was still kind of a big deal. And, but uh, behind the scenes, it was rather an interest in exploring uh, the problem of multiplicity and how to produce these kinds of irreducibly complex situations. And I don't think this entirely succeeds here. Uh, but to do so through the issue of very simple commands. And so uh, this was a collaboration with a sculptor. So this was also the start of uh, beginning to consider languages that could then be distributed through these unusual patterns. But interesting ideas started to emerge from it, uh, dealing more to, uh, with uh, familial relationships or groupings that are indeterminate and multiplying without exact results. This was then followed up by uh, another project where we were trying to propose something to be built in the Sheep's Meadow, which didn't end up going forward. But this then became an, uh, an interesting kind of expansion of this idea to see if uh, even things like programming or zoning or space in general could be understood through, I guess, uh, more uh, in terms of auras or atmospheres. And this, too, is also kind of an old project. So I'm kind of proceeding here chronologically. So I was, in order to try and uh, do this, not uh, through uh, intuitive uh, extrapolations, but to do it uh, uh, through precise drawing or modeling, I started looking very closely at software dealing with the analysis of the weather by meteorology. And I was fascinated to discover that they had entirely different paradigms for understanding geometry. Uh, they really didn't have uh, shapes or figures. They were dealing primarily in pure intensities, obviously enough, because this is the weather after all. So it, it's a drawing convention based on vectors, dynamically evolving surfaces of intensities, and it was absolutely mesmerized. So I started looking into uh, fluid dynamics software to see if you could actually use this stuff to model for design. And I think a couple of engineers who saw us doing this were absolutely horrified at what we were doing to their simulation software, because we were basically treating it almost like an Etch-a-Sketch. And we weren't really after a solution at all. But it became kind of an interesting project for us to how to uh, develop very complex geometries through, again, th through very simple commands. Those of you who have seen our PS1 project, you can see then the direct uh, link up with uh, how we approached it. Again, there was this kind of camouflage about rope and tying things up and nautical imagery, all of which was bullshit, actually. It was really a continuation of this line of thought. But this macrame technique uh, ended up becoming very interesting, way more interesting than I thought it would be because it is a very finite language of sequencing only four different types of topologies. So it became a very primitive programming language, practically. So we were, and this is something we've always done, we've tried to uh, be clever or cunning, uh, almost uh, pirating uh, forms of knowledge. And we never felt uh, any kind of uh, commitment to an orthodoxy. We never were interested in finding the right way to do something. We were always interested in the moment anybody told us that this was the right way, we would run the other direction. So this was a case in point where we were looking at both the contemporary mathematics journal on, 
on not topologies, but also simultaneously looking at the encyclopedia of knots and fancy rope work, which is incidentally an absolutely fantastic book. So this is a lot of the esoterica that happens in behind the scenes in our studio. And I'll speak about this more towards the end, we're about halfway through. And this goes back to my comment earlier about our commitment to sublimating the techniques as much as possible, and instead foregrounding other things, that is, conditions of its estranged reading. And we don't want to ever insist on a correct reading, so we'd like to practice what we preach, that we, in fact, deliberately try to work in a very impersonal way, where we overload the work with things that seem on the verge of signification, but never quite get there. The reason why we do this is uh, it's, it's actually reactionary, because uh, over the past 15 years, I think uh, we were very critical of uh, rhetoric that valorized uh, the architectural object relative to methodologies or techniques, that is, theories for how they were being made, whether it's uh, a bureaucratic instrument related to program or zoning or some kind of methodology related to software and form generation. For us, it was still the same type of argument where what was being addressed was not the architectural object itself, but more uh, the theory that then would legitimize it. So this was an interesting moment uh, when, in reading Margaret Cohen's beautiful article, Fluid States, uh, I came across this reference to uh, Turner's painting, the famous painting that's at the table. I had never realized, uh, and it was uh, sh astonishing to read this, that Turner was very deliberately following on uh, Michael Faraday's electromagnetism diagrams. Upon digging, they were both uh, at the Royal Academy at the same time. So, one can assume that they had struck up a friendship. And if you compare Turner's paintings preceding this, the brush strokes are extremely different. It's more of a blotting or blaring technique. I'm mostly uh, talking about the way he would paint the atmosphere, how he painted the aura, how he would paint the nature, the clouds. And that transformed to something much more linear and exact. And when you put these two next to each other, it's quite clear that there was a profound influence here. However, I think as talking about uh, a form generation technique based on a digital uh, uh, idea to legitimize the value of an architectural project would be as absurd as Turner talking about Michael Faraday in the presentation of this painting. It has nothing to do with that. It's an absolutely painterly innovation, and nothing but that. The crossover happens promiscuously, almost in a cunning, pirate-like way, where it is not methodological at all. And in fact, it's a, the relationship is occluded and essentially strange. We could see that there's some kind of crossover happening, but it's nothing we can abstract as a methodology. So these were some of the ideas behind our not garden project. Third point, uh, ambiguity and indeterminacy, uh, ink blots, for example. So as we started uh, working uh, in this way and as our thoughts started maturing, it started uh, becoming obvious that we needed to start looking at uh, readings or interpretations. <coughs> I came across this photograph, and I, initially uh, I was, uh, I had totally misread it. I think this is uh, 
that's how crazy you get as an architect sometimes, that you just can't see things in the normal way anymore. So my first thought was, who did this project? Mm -hmm. Nice curvilinear metal surface, some kind of chase on it. And then I read the caption, it's Evelyn McHale, who jumped off the Empire State Building in 1947, landed on top of the black limousine. So it started, uh, I don't know if I could still, I don't know if I can even today still put into words exactly what changed uh, that day when I started thinking about this. But soon thereafter, our work started becoming much more aggressive in terms of uh, this kind of projected uh, facts. And this was followed by this uh, show at the artist space organized by Georgina and Marcella. And so this was, uh, I don't know if I ever told you that whole story, but this was why we were so interested in Rorschach tests right around that time. Because uh, the ultimate uh, empty signifier is the Rorschach test. And it's something that is never deliberately composed mean anything. It's essentially meaningless. But it's used as a kind of surrogate for interpretations. And it's kind of a funny thing, because if you wanted to do a psychological exam on somebody, you would expect to put a blank screen in front of them, project whatever you want onto the blank screen. But we all know when we, what happens when we stare at a blank screen. Nothing happens. We don't see a goddamn thing. So it's, it's quite fascinating that meaningless articulation just push towards certain uh, almost raw base conditions of composition, like simple symmetry that force a certain degree of anthropomorphic or ron size reading, can just open up an entire world of interpretation. And what's most interesting to me about it is you can't say about a Rorschach test that any single interpretation is a correct or an incorrect one. Curiously enough, uh, Herman Rorschach got the whole idea from what was essentially a parlor. They referred to it as plexography. People would sit around drinking, and whoever would come up with the most outlandish poem that would go with the random ink stain would win, win the prize. And so it's, it has a kind of an interesting root that didn't begin with science. And so we started developing, uh, again, this is related to the previous work, how to compose something very uh, impersonal, something that is not a projection of ourselves, but more dealing, again, on a very technical level, uh, almost uh, uh, ink drop by ink drop. It's something that is utterly meaningless, but yet uh, it's uh, being pushed towards certain uh, base conditions of interpretation. So a kind of deliberate uh, attempt to compose an exacting ambiguity or indeterminacy is what interested us here. And it seemed like an interesting critical stance on what was emerging at the time with digital formatting and theories of how to use the computer. So this became, uh, this image that you see here is a kind of uh, mongrel technique uh, that we were referring to as uh, digital staining, which uh, then uh, won't bore you with the technicalities, but uh, basically got uh, married to uh, other tessellation techniques we were experimenting with. But in doing so, and this is the value of being committed to technique, but not as a, not in terms of following orthodoxies, but to constantly be, to have the attitude of uh, cunning or cleverness or breaking rules that we never would have crossbred some of the things that we have been studying if it wasn't for that attitude, which essentially allowed us to approach a degree of complexity in the geometry that uh, 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 I think surprised a lot of people. We shopped uh, the geometry around all over the eastern seaboard and basically fabricators were telling us to get the hell out of here. Nuts. And finally we found somebody that seemed as crazy as we were and they took it on and 
and uh, it was quite interesting what it took to get it done. And at the opening, uh, I was very excited because people were coming up to us with all kinds of bizarre interpretations of what we were thinking and were convinced that we were uh, keeping it secret from them and demanding that uh, we confirm or deny like, their interpretation. And, and I thought that that was a great success. That was almost exactly what we were after. How to produce something like a Rorschach test that was absurdly intricate, but essentially meaningless. But at the same time, uh, this is the optimistic side of this story that we were very interested in how an architectural object could be open to many conflicting interpretations all at once. So here you could probably also see the kind of research we were also doing, studying, we're, we're getting progressively more and more interested in architectural history now. And we're beginning to look at Frank Lloyd Wright's textile blocks as we're looking at Lou Sullivan. I was studying his treatise on how to generate ornament. And if you look carefully at Sullivan's treatise, what he describes in this kind of uh, really weird sea germ theory that he has is a geometry that actually resembles polygonal model. And even in Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, textile block houses, uh, and you know all about this, uh, it was kind of a very kind of pragmatic idea on one level. But what's hardly ever talked about is the bizarre uh, presence it has in terms of its projected meanings. So much so that it's incredible that a house can be the stage set for everything from Blade Runner to House on Haunted Hill. And I think this is a kind of success that we haven't discussed enough of in our country. Which brings me to the fourth point, uh, objects. This will take a little bit of explaining. And just as an anecdote, I start with uh, this image. This one always fascinated me because this is an image of Christ as architect. So he's holding the compass. And I think uh, this, uh, even though it may seem so extreme, is kind of lurking behind all of us, I think. The idea of the architect as an enlightened mind that breathes form into formlessness. We still uh, think of material as being uh, at least prepared to be generic so that it could receive uh, the enlightened forms. And I think this is something that's becoming more and more untenable in recent times, to persist in thinking that the human being is some, somehow an altogether different kind of being from every other kind of being, is something that is becoming more and more difficult to hang on to. I think uh, in Solaris, for example, this great movie by Tarkovsky on Stanislaw Lem's book, uh, the strange ocean that is Solaris it is an absolutely masterful cinematic uh, depiction of the problem of talking to the alien being. That is, uh, there are things that we simply will never be able to understand. And I think this is really at the background of what's happening in contemporary philosophy today. It is essentially the demotion of the human being not the below everything else, but on, simply on the same ontological plane as everything else. That there is nothing especially enlightened about me, the human object, versus this uh, bottle, for example, this inanimate object. And this is something that I think is very, very difficult. I think it almost gets to the heart of what's difficult about what we hang on to as our so some introductions here, going from left to right. You have Ian Hamilton Graham. You have Graham Harmon, uh, who incidentally will come to lecture at Sinaiticus coming fall. 
Next to his right is Quentin Mayasu, newly appointed professor at the Sorbonne. So you'll be hearing a lot about him. And then to his right, Ray Brazier. These four got together at Goldsmiths College about five years ago. And out of uh, convenience almost, they hatched a kind of name for themselves. And they invented this term, speculative realism. And the term realism here is an interesting thing to look to, because realism is a philosophical school that has been hopelessly out of fashion since Immanuel Kant. So they're doing something pretty radical just by re-engaging uh, realism itself. But then to add the term speculative to the term realism is what got everybody excited. Graham Harmon, uh, who was my classmate uh, in college, he uh, was the one who, within the speculative realism direction, coined the term object-oriented ontology. The terms here don't really matter. I think what matters here is uh, what I already pointed out about a way to think about breaking this uh, tether between the mind and the world, where we have to think about the world by keeping the mind outside of it, and what kinds of thoughts, what systems of philosophy can ensue through the demotion, then, of the human mind or the human being onto the same ontological plane as everything else. So the reason why this should interest us, I think, is we rely so much on certain categories of judgment that is embedded in a much older ontology. So to look at this new generation of philosophers, and these guys are all my age now, so that in and of itself I'm kind of interested in. But what they're all trying to think about right now is how to move past uh, this problem of mind and re-engage the problem of the real. So this is Graham Harmon's favorite example. And I think uh, it's a nice little summary of what's so peculiar about object-oriented ontology. He says, imagine a, a ball of cotton and a match, and then the match lights the cotton on fire. In the burning of the cotton, the burning had nothing to do with the fact that the cotton was white, that it was light, that it was hairy, that it was made from these plants, so on and so forth. And so what's happening in this relationship is the interaction of these two objects does not exhaust all the qualities of the other. In fact, it is the essential ontological condition of objects that its qualities are inexhaustible. Then comes the punchline. Uh, we're no different than the match or the cotton. When we sit on a chair, we're not exhausting all the possibilities of, of the chair, and vice versa. Sitting in the chair does not turn me into the thing that sits in the chair. We, as objects, are also inexhaustible and essentially strange. All objects are strange in this sense. So as I started getting to know uh, this line of thought, I started thinking inevitably, of course, OK, what about the object that we call the architect and the object that we call the building? What is happening between the interaction of those two objects? And I'm not going to give you any kind of answer to that tonight. And I think it's probably a line of thought that's going to unfold uh, over the next 10 years. I think uh, there are a lot of interesting, important questions here. And this is all preliminary. But one thing's for sure. Our obsessions with networks, deals, methods, relationships has redirected our attention away from what was strange about the architectural object in the first place. And it seems difficult these days to talk about what is uh, estranged about the great architecture.
So my final point here about craft, and that's a word that I'm using temporarily in my book. By craft, uh, I'm not so interested in handiwork or authenticity, individuality, in terms of cults of personality, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not that interested in signature, except for the fact that that person actually has that signature and they can't seem to help it. I'm interested in how in this discourse about objects and the demotion of the human mind down on the same ontological plane as other objects, including the buildings here, one begins to have to think very differently about how we go about uh, engaging ideas, techniques, know-how, how do we go about doing things? Do we actually need a comprehensive theory? Recall my previous point about theory and the phenomena in the section about irreducible complexity. When it comes to certain types of things, the thing itself is the theory. This is a picture of Captain James Cook. And this is the same article by Margaret Cohen uh, when I was talking about Faraday and Turner earlier. Uh, Margaret Cohen talks about an entry from James Cook's diary. They were, uh, they hit a ground uh, when they were at the Great Barrier Reefs. Keep in mind that no one had ever been there before, at least from Europe anyway. They had no idea where they were. They had no idea how the tides were working. They had no idea what the Great Barrier Reef was, but they've run aground far out short. So at the frontier, where knowledge comes to an edge condition, Margaret Cohen describes the absolute cunning and cleverness of James Cook in piling together garbage and feces, horse dung, uneaten food, wrapped up into a bowl of fabric, tossing it overboard and having the incoming flood of high tide then shove that ball of, uh, of excrement and garbage into the, the hole that was struck by the reef, plugging it up, and uh, they ended up letting the ship rising from the reef, then they went to shore and repaired the ship. So Cohen is very interested in this kind of illegitimate knowledge of the pirate or the illegitimate knowledge of how one operates when you're at the edge of uh, rational knowledge. And this is what I'm interested in relative to the word craft. This is uh, Farron Adria. And some of you know uh, of my interest in molecular gastronomy. And uh, if you've never heard of that term before, in summary, this is some of the highest end cooking in the world. Uh, Farron Adria's El Bui is was, when it was opened, the most celebrated restaurant in the world. And it was very controversial and beautifully paralleled a lot of stuff we've been going through in digital architecture. Because what Adria did was he incorporated scientific techniques, unconventional, somewhat digital tools, and broke all kinds of rules about how to prepare dishes. And so he was heavily criticized for breaking tradition, for not following the discipline, even though he was incredibly versed in the discipline of traditional cooking. And, and uh, interestingly enough, also accused of making unhealthy dishes that would hurt you. Those who have been to his restaurant uh, and and like it, I guess, proclaimed that he achieves the production of new sensations that were thought to be impossible. Just when you thought everything under the sun could have been cooked, here comes Fran Adria pirating techniques from all these different fields and inventing new dishes. And as a food critic from the 18th century said, the invention of a new dish might be more profound than the discovery of a new star. This brings me finally to Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks is the source of the HeLa cell, or the HeLa tissue cell culture. 
this is pretty standard stuff, uh, practically a, tone, a, a copier paper in medical labs. It's a kind of basic, kind of white bread of uh, tissue cultures for testing uh, the effect of viruses or behavior of cancer cells, so on and so forth. No one knew where the HeLa cell culture came from until recently. The story goes, uh, Henrietta Lacks came into Johns Hopkins in 1950 with uterine cancer. And uh, in the kind of uh, rush of the bureaucracy that had forgotten about her, and she had passed away. Her doctor, later on, when he was checking her tissue samples, was horrified to discover her cells were still subdivided. Upon culturing her cells over years, was horrified again to discover that they may have discovered the first immortal cell line. And then this became one of uh, the most important medical products over the next four years. Recently, it came to light where the HeLa cell tissue culture came from. And she has uh, descendants, and they ask some very strange questions. Uh, one granddaughter asked, uh, so what does this mean? Does it mean she's still alive? Another asked, so how much are we going to get paid? <laughs> Another asked, where is she? So this is the thing that's on our table right now. And we have other boring stuff that we're doing, but this is the, the weird thing we're doing. And it seems like a good way to end tonight. Uh, I came across some funding at Pratt, and I had also gotten to know this uh, group of interesting synthetic biologists, as they call themselves. They were young uh, academics like myself, who at prominent research universities were frustrated that they were not allowed to study what they actually wanted to study because they had to plug into existing NIH grant lines and so on and so forth. So what they did was they got together and opened up what they called the first community laboratory, the first community bio lab. And it's hilarious. They liken it to a gymnasium where you pay a membership fee and you can come and work in a level one lab. And they do some pretty weird stuff in there. So when I got to know some of these people, one of them had mentioned to me how they had always been interested in uh, producing a biological uh, watch, as he called it. I don't even know what that would even mean. But uh, it got us into a conversation about uh, how to crossbreed our pre-existing kind of experiments in fabrication, 3D printers and so on, with the experiments they've been doing with culturing tissues. So we got together and we proposed uh, building a bioprinter. And so this is what we're going to send to the FRAC Center when their building opens on September 5th. So what would it mean to print in living tissue? What would it mean to print in living matter. And this is a kind of initial kind of speculation we're having. Well, what would it be like to have a living uh, piece of art or live painting, painting you've got to feed or keep free from infection? Then it started getting into a discussion about uh, could you produce a kind of tattoo that was disembodied? This is uh, the Genspace folk, and they've been causing quite a stir, actually. There have been articles about them in the current time, so on. Uh, three of them are TED fellows. Uh, I guess you recognize the upper left guy. Uh, on the upper right, uh, that's Richard Sorak, who's my colleague at Pratt, and he's uh, quite an expert in building 3D printers himself, by himself uh, from parts. Then in the lower left, you have Oliver Medvedic, who's the director of research at Genspace. And on the right, you have Nina Tandon, who's uh, part of a, uh, a laboratory at Columbia University that uh, is investigating printing uh, a heart. And 
it's quite creepy. You can actually see her on the TED website showing her heart tissues. She sends a current and it beats. Very strange stuff. So this was the first prototype of the kind of do-it-yourself 3D printer. The printer itself, the parts are printed from other 3D printers, so that too is kind of interesting. The print head, uh, if you could call it that, is just a stepper motor that uh, regulates the extrusion of a medical syringe. So it's a kind of contraption worthy of a cybernetic William S. Burroughs. Some photos from the lab. So here are graduate students from Pratt Architecture looking through microscopes. The first kind of day when we're all kind of ogling this uh, contraption. There's Nina passaging the cells. It's kind of an amazing process. It's painstaking, actually. It's very labor intensive. Uh, the cells have to be washed. Uh, that's uh, kind of a simple way of putting it. And so that uh, they don't uh, clump up too much together. And uh, they have to be washed with these enzymes that uh, prepare the surfaces. And then we have to carefully multiply them in a bath and just keep uh, producing generations. We're indeed culturing them. And it's essentially the toner for the printer. Here's the first one we did a couple months ago. And so what we've been doing is we've been fabricating the machine on one end and culturing the cells on the other. And only in the last uh, couple of weeks have they been now coming together. So uh, the joke is, and, and this is just a metaphor because uh, this analogy of the printer on the one side and the toner on the other side really starts breaking down because we're talking about living cells after all. So the toner here is uh, NI3T3 mouse cartilage cells, which is an immortalized line of mouse cartilage. It's deposited uh, initially onto this stuff. This is the expensive stuff in the project. This is uh, spun collagen, which is like a kind of a sponge uh, made up out of uh, like a skin tissue, basically. And uh, it's industrially produced, and it forms the scaffolding for the cells. And like I said, they have to be fed, kept free from infection. And one of them died. Uh, they died quite frequently, actually. This one died from a fungal infection. Then uh, the biologist proposed transfecting them with GFP cells, which is a kind of non-destructive kind of uh, tagging of these cartilage cells. So when they're on the black light, they glow in the dark. And there's an, a red, green, and blue variety, in fact. And we've only started playing with uh, initial sloppy prints. And I was very uh, touched when my assistant sent me back this photograph uh, last week, where they monogrammed my initials with the glow in the dark and mouse cartilage. <laughs> We're exploring ex uh, replacing the collagen scaffolding with hydrogel so we can then extrude them into controllable forms. This is the protocol written to us by, by Nina. Uh, it resembles some kind of recipe. It's actually quite interesting what each of these steps actually accomplish. And then on our side, in our studio, we have the unfortunate task of speculating what the hell do we print? Does it even matter what we print? So you can see this is uh, the strangest of our thought experiments. And I really see no benefit to architecture here in the kind of practical sense or scientific sense. Uh, we get questions like this all the time. So you expect to make buildings out of skin? Uh, no, uh, absolutely not. This is actually, what it is for us is an experiment in problematizing the relationship of medium and content. And for us, uh, a kind of appropriately absurd endgame to 
our sequence of digital studies. So the last slides I'm going to show you today, just as a kind of a recap, I guess, or even just a kind of uh, punchline. Um, Max Ernst did these amazingly intricate paintings, and you may have seen this. Uh, what you may not know is the technique he used to produce such intricacy. He uh, used a technique that's uh, fairly well known uh, amongst painters. It's referred to as the calcomania. Uh, and it's a very peculiar kind of pattern that's like a miniature thermodynamic reaction where you sandwich paint really hard between two sheets of glass and you squeeze it. So you get all this veining happening in the pressure. And then you would just kind of transfer that pattern onto a canvas. So he would produce all this intricacy for, for free, all this complexity for free. He didn't have to theorize it, or rather the thing itself was the theory. And then he would, of course, go back in and try and, a la Rorschach test, see what he will have seen in that pattern. And he sees a bird's head and a sphere, and then he and then he starts uh, adding things like, like a cow's head or an ox or a horn. So none of which was really there, which I find very interesting. But certainly there could have been a lot of other things there. So even uh, this kind of emblem of abstraction, you know, Pollock, famously he said, I am nature. I love this photograph of a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And I think a lot of people took that quote as a kind of grandiose, arrogant statement. But, uh, and maybe they were right. Uh, but I would like to think that it might be interpreted in the reverse. To say, I am nature might actually be a demotion that is bringing ourselves down to the level of other objects. And I'm very interested to see what there is to think about architecture at that point. Obviously not from the school of architecture. It's a very refreshing. I have a problem with church when I was in high school, so I have built buildings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I don't really know how to answer that. Uh, because, uh, but I, I am going to try. Uh, it's just me apologizing for the lame answer. Um, I think uh, uh, a lot of this is uh, kind of uh, bracketing off for myself a uh, uh, first phase of work in building uh, you know, my career. I don't know if I could even call it career building. That's a really weird way to put it, I guess. But uh, I found it necessary given uh, the circumstances in which I uh, studied to be an architect and just uh, the general state of the discipline crazy hiccups that is on their own, that it's very important, I think, to problematize technology and to problematize sciences and not uh, have it be a kind of a handmade a culture, nor would I want the 
cultural operations like uh, designing buildings to become a handmaid of the sciences or the, of philosophy, etc. I, I think uh, uh, I found it necessary to get to know these other things and to take a long, hard look at it. Uh, oftentimes, I think uh, uh, I've been asked, uh, well, what do you think about uh, the state of the discipline? And what do you think about uh, whether or not we might have lost too much of our own kind of historical momentum? Uh, what is it about uh, architecture that remains, and should we focus on that? And I guess uh, uh, my, my answer has always been, uh, uh, I myself uh, never had to, I guess, I never felt like I had to worry about it because I was obsessed with our discipline to begin with. And without that belief or interest in the discipline, I probably would not have got interested in these other things to begin with. It's more, I think, my reading of what the disciplinary problems are that I think the technological and the philosophical have to be reassessed. So uh, it's a kind of to be continued answer. You know, and I think you're reading it correctly, that it's a kind of dancing between different poles. But uh, I promise you, it's decidedly from the point of view of architecture. It's from the plateau of architecture that I'm looking at these things. And uh, the biologists see that right away, too. You know, when we're in the lab. Uh, I'm definitely not one of them. But exactly what leads to that conclusion on their part, I think is somewhat ineffable. You know, but uh, they, they know I'm not a scientist, that's for sure. Disagree with that. Okay. I, I think that's uh, how we understand it as a colloquialism. Uh, I like how in the Margaret Tone piece she goes back to the literal roots of the word and points out that that was originally a word related to navigation, to steer, to point the ship in the direction, find a way. Which is an interesting definition of the word. Like when the map stops, and now you're going to the other side of where the map has stopped, how do you steer the boat? How do you find your way? How do you navigate the frontier and use cunning, use craft, cleverness, or illegitimate knowledge? That I find a really interesting way to understand the problem. I guess I'm, I'm turning back to Wilfield. I'm keen to think of cunning as a trick. Um, and I guess I, I wouldn't uh, necessarily put it in a negative way, but I think that a lot of the last biological stuff um, has a certain trick like mm -hmm. bachelor machine mm -hmm. quality, right? um, which often meant, was meant to uncover some Anticipated um, or un, uh, overlooked consequences of, of technology. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, to expose their otherwise, um, to, to expose what otherwise would, would seem to be business as usual mm -hmm. as something that is radically weird. Um, and I guess I, I would want to know then what it is that that exposes. Um, what kind of trick are you playing um, in order to see way, your way through that frontier? Um, I guess that's um, almost because I believe that, that even in craft, 
There are a lot of circumstances that led to uh, the opportunity and also the injuries. Uh, things that uh, I really didn't see coming. And it's not like I planned this out for years. Uh, it was just there, available, and I took it, you know, because it seemed the right time to do it. And uh, I, I think I still have to figure out the, the ways in which to spin the argument for this. Okay, but. Um, uh, you're right. Uh, 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 I'm definitely frustrated by the familiarity of technology. And what I think is emerging as uh, awful orthodoxies about how to go about doing things and how to use certain tools. And this is connected to my interest in the object-oriented ideas that the interest here is to expose the essential strangeness of things, because I think it's there in the state of estrangement of these objects that there's maximum possibility for what I'm interested in in architecture. So, so I think, uh, uh, you know, let's see, you know, down the road, eventually I am going to have to grow up and start you know, testing these things. Right? And I, I'm too, I'm kind of curious like, uh, like how this will all play out. But uh, I'm not interested in uh, being a, a technologist. I'm not interested in printing flesh you know, uh, beyond this project. This is really just kind of one-off. Uh, it has meaning just here and now. But uh, the, the problem that I'm trying to address is uh, tools like the 3D printer, for example, which is still relatively new. And meanwhile, uh, you have a company like uh, 3D Systems, like Autodesk, has been going around buying up all the 3D printing companies. Uh, you can actually see them on the stock exchange. And so this kind of cornering of the market, making rational, uh, making applicable, uh, that's what makes things familiar. And I think uh, this is a, a story that you may not be entirely sympathetic to when you're about to graduate from school. I think you're more worried about uh, you know, getting down to business and learning how to do things the right way and making money and so on, being professional. But uh, I think, uh, uh, I think we, we are in a time where uh, I feel like we're rushing I think it's inevitably going to have to solidify, and practices, of course, will have to emerge. But I, th I just think it's happening a little bit too fast. You know, I don't think it's been totally digested. And I think we're leaving a lot on the table still. I don't think we've exhausted all the good stuff that's still there. So uh, that project is, you're right, it, it is a bit of a cleverness to destabilize certain things. And uh, of course, uh, you know, it's, it is important that it's going to be for an exhibition at the track and so on, you know, the kind of audience and so on and so forth. Especially in France, where the, where the biological issues are just so charged up right now. I mean, there are a lot of moving parts here behind the kind of caricature through which I present it. But that's part of the strategy to try and done. So you, in the part of the talk that you, you then challenged um, the example of the top of the fire, or the top of the fire, the fire being this poignant, but extraordinarily unique relationship between the
is it that is it somehow to get back to the understanding of the object, the, or are you actually interested in architects? <laughs> well, I think um, at that point uh, we could, I could have easily said that about any human being or any practitioner, not just architect. But, but, yeah. but uh, what's important to me about that, this emotion of uh, the intellect is uh, that's the thing I think precludes the possibility of craft. Because when we are an, an intellect, or we still, if we operate out of an ontology of enlightenment or access to the absolute, then we can completely discredit the strange contingencies of the things themselves, because of course we have no access to it. Of course, just like Kant said, we have no access to the things. But uh, if we are actually on the same ontological plane as the things, so we ourselves are things in and of themselves. I think uh, we can look at the interaction of these objects that is you with uh, what you thought was generic, that chunk of concrete, but it's actually not generic. Everything is specific, and it's interactive. It's interacting, and new objects are coming into being. So it's, it's, it's just a, there's something very enigmatic about this, too, I gotta admit. You know? uh, I don't want to put myself as a kind of interpreter of triple O expert on it. I, I'm still getting to know it, but th there are things about it that I find absolutely intriguing. You know, I should point that out. Uh, you know, uh, my fresh, my first day of uh, freshman year, you know, morning I studied Euclid's definitions, and afternoons I learned the Greek alphabet. And, you know, so I, I kind of went from that through, you know, the Bible to uh, the Kant and Hume and Einstein and so it was kind of a crazy chronology you know, in that weird program. So from, from having been exposed to it, you know, and people joke about that program. It's like a, you, you see all this, but you don't become an expert in any of it. You know, so it kind of produces dilettantes, right? And, but one thing that kind of exposure to the entire breadth of uh, canon uh, provided was my ability to recognize this thing that came along as being very different. And this is not just a passing fad. There is a true innovation here at work, I think. And it's just budding. I think there's a long way for it to go. There are aspects of it that are totally bizarre and incomprehensible. Some of it's just sloppy thought still. But the core, core idea here in the kind of emotion of the enlightened mind uh, is, is a very interesting turn, I think. And, uh, and uh, Graham tells me whenever he goes to speak at other departments beyond the philosophy department, he always uh, points out that there's this incredible hunger to examine the implications of this shift in ontology for their field, for their practice be it economy, be it comparative literature, be it artists or musicians or architects. And you can see for yourself in the fall when it comes here to LA. You know. But he's uh, strangely uh, reluctant to address that. You know, because he, as he says, he's much more interested in just figuring out uh, the fine points of uh, his philosophy as philosophy. And he's completely interested in getting to know us is very interested in seeing how we develop it, uh, or whether or not there is uh, any interaction at all. I think uh, he also points out it may not have relevance to it. But uh, I think he himself admits that uh, it's really unpredictable what the applications are. But, uh, so I think, uh, uh, because I, I, I've known him for so long, and I think uh, there is an aspect of this where we were re reading the exact same books, you know, and we talked about similar things during those four years. So it's interesting that he kind of went in the direction of philosophy and I went in the direction of architecture. But uh, I think uh, my sense is he's trying to work on the same kind of problems that are interesting to us. And it might be something generational.
first, I haven't read unless Le Tour to say anything on Torah Tate of Europe. But uh, I, I will point out uh, Graham uh, has a great deal of respect for Le Tour. Uh, Le Tour's uh, actor network theory, uh, Armin points out, as being a real forerunner of what he worked on, what Graham's working on. Uh, but however, Harmon himself points this out, that this is a real problem with Latour's uh, framework. That uh, he, he nonetheless uh, uh, reverts to uh, what Harmon calls a kind of undermining philosophy. That is, uh, what you see ultimately is not real because of something else happening. That things are coming from. That is the network or what Latour has referred to as plasma. Plasma, the novelty, and things around. And Harmon, uh, I think, is a, a actually a much more rigorous uh, thinker, uh, where he says, well, "Why do we even have to posit that? Why don't we just uh, take the objects as objects, and uh, and that's that? And there is no explanation. So it, there is something quite old school about it too. That I, I don't think he's uh, promising some new insight into things." is more, uh, I think, a, a very rigorous kind of placement of um, uh, ontological problems that's come. And uh, the value I see in it is uh, it kind of redirects attention away from the way in which network theory has made this argument that there is something underlying things that is the deeper reality. Harmon is uh, attempting to take that away. There are relationships on that, <laughs> but you know, uh, it's one of these things where I don't want to get too deep into the discourse about object-oriented ontology myself. And I know Jason's been reading it, and I know Jason too is reluctant to talk about the philosophy itself so, uh, because uh, I, I don't think that that's anything that really gives value you know, to things uh, that we uh, just within our own field. So. Uh, that's why I, I would much rather talk about the projects just on their own terms, because that would also be the kind of point of object-oriented ontology, that there really cannot be a kind of uh, other ideality or abstraction that legitimizes objects, that they, they're simply real. That's all they are. I think uh, part of that too is, um, uh, th like I mentioned at the beginning, this is kind of a delicious uh, moment for me, you know, just because uh, these two lectures out here in California and just being out here so much, it's like the third time I've been in this room this semester and getting to know all of my friends once again. It's, uh, it, it's a kind of moment where I'm trying to just concretize the stuff that's been going on. And just uh, output uh, it as a kind of theory uh, for better or worse. Uh, also, so I can move on. So uh, I would probably predict, like five years from now, uh, if I'm back here in this room, you'll probably see a very different lecture, most likely. It's uh, you're catching me in a moment of transition, as I say, where I'm very much theory focused. <laughs>